All right. I think we're live. We are. Hi, John. How are Hi. you? Good. Awesome. Good to be here. <laughs> Thanks for inviting me. You're very welcome. You're always welcome to join. All right. I think we're up. Go ahead. And you, know, you said you wanted to have a couple words and then I'll jump into my stuff. Sure. I, you know, I love that we're talking about pricing. So this is going to be a, a great conversation, I think. <laughs> Everybody hates pricing. Yeah. So I, I, that's all I've got to say. We can just get things rolling. All right. So uh, like, let's, I'll start officially then. Uh, thanks, John. <laughs> all right. And hi, everyone. Welcome. I'm, uh, my name's Dean. Um, when my daughter was, my daughter Vivian, she's my oldest daughter. When she was around eight, we were at a supermarket and she asked me what a price was. Mm. And, and I loved that question because nobody had ever asked me what a price was, right? Eight-year-olds will ask you really crazy questions. Um, a lot of breakthroughs come from asking really simplistic questions that we don't ask anymore. And, and seeing if the first answers that we, we keep on file in our brains are still useful, right? And valid. So let me see if I can get these slides going. Yeah. So that's what we're going to do. So the answer I came up with that an eight-year-old would understand uh, is that a price is a guess that the store makes about how much the people in the store will pay for something. And I think that's a pretty good answer because the fact that a price is a guess is also why pricing is one of the hardest things to figure out in our businesses. And pricing is also personal for a lot of us, right? Especially when you're a very small business and very especially if you're a services type of company because time used is time gone forever. So you don't get to resell it over and over, right? And price also feels personal because it feels like it's a measure of your worth, uh, but it isn't a measure of your worth. It's a guess about what other people think something is worth. And today I'm gonna tell three stories about preserving your negotiating power when you're discussing your price, uh, preserving your margin so your price is worthwhile for you because there's nothing worse than like working and not thinking you're getting what you should get, and uh, preserving your place at the top of the price pyramid or one way to get to the top of the price pyramid. So we're going to start off by talking about a keep the lights on customer and other customers. So maybe 10 years ago now, um, I had a business where I had about a dozen professional speakers around the US and Canada as clients. And I would help them write um, outbound marketing. I would create webinars for them. And in, in a couple of cases, I would sort of like run through their keynote and sort of like, you know, help them write their keynotes. And uh, I don't know if you know this, but most professional speakers struggle to make $100,000 total for a whole year, right? We hear about people like Hillary Clinton getting $300,000 for one speech, but the, like a fraction of the 1% of top paid speakers get that kind of money. Everyone else uh, struggles to get, you know, even to six figures you know, across the entire year. And for, uh, as I started talking to them about their uh, revenue and looking at their calendars and how we're gonna get them booked and that kind of stuff, uh, this pattern kept emerging. If you looked at a 12 month pattern, right? Where they would kind of have nothing and they'd be marketing and scrambling and selling and hustling. And then they would tend to get either like a really big speech at a big conference or something, or else they'd get a corporate contract where someone would say, Hey, can you travel around to our offices? This is pre COVID obviously when you could travel around to people's offices and talk to our people around motivation or customer service or whatever. Right. And uh, they would, you know, and then their revenue would spike up for you know, uh, a few months. And then it would crash down again to basically zero. And uh, of course, while they were busy making all the money, they weren't filling their pipeline and you know, marketing and stuff. And I thought that was their problem, right? I thought that was it. We need to keep marketing and stuff. And you do always need to keep marketing and putting yourself out there and filling your pipeline for the next one. Uh, but it turns out that wasn't actually the reason that it crashed all the way down to zero. And then this other thing happened where they never seemed to make as high a rate or get as much revenue or the margins were always lower or tighter on whatever happened after that, after their sort of second of the year crash down feast and famine cycle. And they're in the famine cycle and they get up again. So I didn't figure like, it took me a while to sort of dig in and figure out what was happening here. And it wasn't happening to everybody. For some of the speakers, they had a different pattern right now. Overall, the pattern looks very similar. But what would happen is those those folks were never starting at zero and their sort of second uh, spike 
was usually around as high as the first spike. And so they weren't suffering that like discounted problem that the others have. And it turns out what was happening there is that the, uh, the speakers in the purple and the purple line, they had what they didn't call, but what I would call either I, I, I keep the lights on customer or I keep the lights on uh, side business. They'd have a little training business, a little consulting work, right? And uh, with long-term sort of, you know, client commitments. And it wasn't, you know, they weren't going to get rich off that. It might only be a few thousand dollars a month, but it meant that A, uh, they, they could always plan ahead. They could forecast revenue. They had a floor, right? They were never going to zero. They were always going to be able to pay their mortgage, even if nothing happened. And, and then the other thing that uh, I noticed, and this is like around the second one, is because they had a floor in the sort of like second famine section of the year, uh, they could wait for the price that they wanted. Right? They weren't so desperate. What was happening is not that customers like to pay less in the latter part of the year. It's that these uh, the people in the blue, they were desperate enough that they uh, had to take basically what they could get. And they couldn't really afford to wait out for a better price or a better contract or a better deal. But the people with the keep the lights on business, the keep the lights on customers, you know, just a little trickle of revenue that they could count on, um, they uh, could wait and negotiate from power and not be sort of beaten down uh, and have to take whatever crumbs were available in order to keep some revenue coming into the business. And from that came the concept that different customers in your business will serve different purposes. They're not just different kinds of customers. Your business has like different needs and customers will fill one or more of those slots, right? So you need to actively look for a keep the lights on customer, you know, like a sort of a trickle of revenue from a customer that only needs you for, you know, a few days a month or a few hours a week or whatever, and to keep that going, right? Once in a while, and those are those big strikes. Those are the customers that fill like your bank account. You need those too, obviously, but they can't be the only thing that you're going after, which is the problem that the first set of speakers were, were trying to do, right? Some customers you take on just because of bragging rights. They're going to look good. Their logo is going to look good on your website. You want to be able to say that you worked for them. And, you know, you'll set your price accordingly or take what, you know, uh, seems fair and equitable to you because you're getting more out of it than just the money of that project, right? Or from that client, you're going to leverage that into getting more clients with bigger names. And, you know, and some of them you're just going to take on because it's, it's going to be interesting. It's going to be creative work. It's going to be whatever, right? New skills. The point is you need different kinds of customers and you, you should actively sort customers into different categories in your business and know what category they're in. And if they sort of move out of the category or they no longer make sense for that category, like I'll give you an example. If you took on a project because you saw that this particular skill that you could develop, basically get paid to develop a skill, right? Um, that particular skill, you've got it now. And yet that customer still wants to pay you sort of the lower price. And before you were willing to take a lower price, uh, because you were getting the new skill. Well, now you don't need it anymore. That customer, if they insist on filling that slot, that customer shouldn't be in your business anymore, right? Either move them to another category or wind them down. So nobody stays in the same category forever, except maybe the keep the lights on customers. I love my keep the lights on clients, right? You can have a big crash from a, a big drop in revenue. And this happened to me, you know, just a few months ago. I didn't have to worry because I have my keep the lights on clients. No matter what happens, Right? I've, I, I can wait, I can do my own thing, I can focus on marketing and whatever, knowing that I've got that revenue coming. So now, the second uh, thing to talk about uh, around pricing. So we've talked about, you know, keep the lights on customers, new skill customers, bragging right customers. You absolutely should actively sort customers into the in different slots, you know, mentally uh, for your business. And when it doesn't make sense to keep someone there anymore, either get them to move to another slot or you know, wind them down. So the next part is breakthroughs, right? And this uh, this happens when all of a sudden you um, you figured out how to do something in your business, whereby it, for instance, if you normally charge hourly or you charge by a project, and a project for X normally takes you, like, you know, whatever, a hundred hours or five weeks or whatever, that all of a sudden you figured out a way to do it in four weeks or two weeks, right? Uh, and then the, the question comes like. How do I price this now, right? So all of a sudden you can do the same thing faster or you can do it better 
in the same amount of time. So the quality has gone up. So you, you know, in, in your mind, you should be able to charge differently for that, right? Or you can do it better and faster, right? You know, which definitely feels like you should be able to charge more money. Or you've been sort of reinvented it or figured out a way around something so that someone doesn't need to do it anymore or they can do it in a very different way or they can, you know, uh, uh, they can do something new that they never could have done before. So the question is, how do you charge for that? I had one, uh, I was working through a consulting company and I had figured out uh, a way or as I knew how to do a way so that uh, what they were normally paying eight hours for, I could do, you know, in far less. And I uh, was silly and I started charging like what it took me to do it because uh, for that particular contract, I was on an hourly basis. And uh, the consulting company came back and said, like, what are you doing? You need to charge like regular person type of hours. Don't charge them the, the shorter amount of hours. That's that's crazy. Right. They're comparing X to Y. It's OK. And if you know, if you get to finish eight hours in an hour and a half, that's great. It's kind of great for everybody, you know, because they'll have spikes in what they need and so on. But the point is that, you know, what should you do? Right. Generally, when you have any kind of breakthrough, a pricing crisis occurs. Uh, you can't normally go back to a customer and say, hey, I figured out a way to do this way faster, but uh, I'm, well, you would never do this, right? I figured out a way to do this with way less effort, but I'm going to charge you the same amount. Like that conversation should never take place. But then you might say, okay, I figured out how to do something where the quality is way higher uh, for the same amount of work. And so I should be paid more. Like that's a weird conversation. Normally what happens is, and most of us are very strong in the execution side of our business, right? Like we're in a business, especially for a small business, we're in a business because uh, we became particularly good or had a skill set or something and it was valuable to somebody. And so we started selling our work or our output or our time or whatever to do it. And uh, so we're, we're, normally we don't need to worry about making execution, you know, even better than it needs to be. It's usually pretty good or we wouldn't have much of a revenue stream in the first place. But most of us are weak in either sales or marketing, right? I mean, there's a, it's a Venn diagram. So there's a little part in the dead center there where you'd be great at everything. And there's no one who's great at everything. Normally what happens is if you become particularly better at uh, marketing or more innovative in your marketing, you would typically have to really reduce the complexity on your side of selling it, right? You need to, you'd become better at marketing uh, and you change how you sell it so that someone could buy it without much interaction, right? You'd have like pre-made packages of something and copywriting, it's very common. Will uh, uh, someone will advertise that and sell sort of a website review, right? You know, they're not rewriting your website, but they'll go through it with you and uh, provide you with kind of a report and that kind of stuff. And that's something that should just be, you know, you could just, they could buy that online with a credit card. They don't need it. You focus on your marketing. Or if you're particularly good on the sales side, you might decide to, you know, and not ex the execution or marketing, you probably want to just put money into marketing and make it as automated as possible, the Google ads and Facebook ads kind of stuff and outsource the execution. But generally what happens is you make a breakthrough somewhere and your, your challenge is how do I charge for this? of the of the of all of the fellow business people that I've talked to about this problem over the years uh, and almost everyone occur achieve some kind of breakthrough in their business at some point is that the only way to do it is to wind down either the project or the client that you have and then um, reprice for a new client right no one seems to have figured out a way to renegotiate a higher price on a current project. And that's pretty standard, right? Because everyone wants predictability and pricing if you're a customer. But, you know, don't let it come into a crisis where you feel like I should be making more money right now from this person. Just like, basically, you eat that, you bite the bullet, you finish out the project that you're on. Hopefully, this isn't your keep the lights on customer. Although if it was, honestly, who cares? If you're a keep the lights on customer, they're, they're in a slot that they're there for, right? And they have their own role in your business. Uh, I have one keep the lights on customer. They're grandfathered in at a, you know, for, for me is a very low rate. I'm totally fine with that because they're my keep the lights on customer and I love and cherish them and they have their own like place in my brain for why I do that kind of work. But what you end up doing is you, you'll have to renegotiate, you'll have to reprice based on a new project or a, a new customer altogether and not try to negotiate that oh, I'm better at this, or I invested a whole bunch of money in equipment now, or I did this, and so you should pay me more. Like, I don't think a lot of people even try that, but you should never, ever do that. Just hit a reset button with a new project or a new customer and move on from that.
right? And it's worth thinking about why you can't reprice on a current project, right? Like to your client, a project is what they asked for, what they got, how much of their time was required because on any project they have to be, you know, working on it, managing it, keeping status on it, whatever. There's some of their time required, the overall duration of it and how much they paid you, right? But to you, a project is what you're on the hook to deliver, how much effort or time you're going to need to do that. How, and, and, and this is the tricky part, right? The money you get relative to your effort and the client hassle that you had to put up with. And so some customers are just worth more money to you, right? Because they, they're, they're low hassle customers. And other customers are very much uh, high hassle customers. And to a point, no matter how much they pay you, it's kind of not worth dealing with them. You need a longer recovery time. You you have trouble like you know getting motivated to do the work. You know, uh, once the project's over, you kind of need, need a mental health break, and so you're not actually working or selling in there. So you know, some customers, no matter how much you, they pay you, they're just never worth it. But uh, it's worth, and uh, I think I'll put these slides up on LinkedIn. Uh, it's worth understanding that your definition of a project and the client's definition of the project are never going to be the same. And yours are always going to be uh, tied up somewhat in what value and price uh, you think are, uh, you know, how those are counterbalanced in what you're working on. And then the last of the three stories was the, um, the halo. So here's, you can imagine that this is everybody that you compete with, right? I'm technically in the copywriting field. So to me, this is all copywriters. Now, generally what happens, and customers have a very hard time figuring out what any sort of personal service or small business like you know, um, service is worth, right? So they sort of sort very quickly. They don't have a lot of information. You know more about what you do than they will ever know about what you do. And so they have a hard time distinguishing value. Uh, and so what you end up with is basically everything in every field tends to fall into one of three sort of tranches, three like, you know, um, echelons for how they do it. In, in my field, copywriting, and in a lot of fields, right, everyone on the bottom competes on price. This is everybody on Fiverr. This is people on um, Upwork, right? There are people in copywriting, if you just want blog posts or, you know, articles written, where they'll they'll price it by the word, like for three cents a word for whatever it is that you want and that kind of stuff. Right? They're competing solely on price. They're, they're, they're very hard to distinguish from each other. And it's, um, you know, the, the customer only knowing about price then compares everybody on price. Obviously, I don't have to tell anyone on, on, on this session, but this is the worst place for you to be. Like, you don't want to be here. And so what ends up happening is some percentage of those people figure out, they take sort of you know, the advice that you need to pick a niche and specialize, right? And there are different ways around it. You might specialize in only doing certain types of work. You might specialize in only dealing with certain types of customers or industries, Oh, looks like we had some trouble there. Um, so different types of work, different types of industries. You might you know, your your business might be geographical, so you only work in you, know, you, you only work in certain parts of Manhattan or New York City or whatever, right? And so this is great advice, right? It's absolutely moving up the value chain is to pick a niche and then specialize, and you'll end up doing less, but you'll do um, you know more, hopefully more of the work that's profitable or more of the work that you like to do. Um, but what you, what uh, almost everyone stops here, but there's a layer above it that, um, at this point I know, you know, a, a number of people who've moved up to here, but it's, it's very, it, it seems rare. Right. And this is a halo niche, right? So let's look at it this way. A halo niche is where you figured out something that you're willing to do that solves a problem that the customer knows they have but didn't think that the problem was solvable. 
Now, there are a few advantages to having a halo niche. Like, for instance, if you're on the second tier there and, you know, and someone, uh, a client says, hey, since you're here, I don't want to go find another copywriter. Can you like do this? Like, can you just write this article for me? Or can you write this announcement on LinkedIn? Right. And you said, yeah, sure. Right. You charge them the second tier price for the lowest tier work. Right. You don't do it cheaper. And then for uh, in a halo niche, they might ask you to do something that was in the second or, or, or bottom area. And you always charge your halo niche price for that kind of work, right? They're not going to have you do a whole ton of it uh, at that price, but you don't like move your price. Oh, sorry, Diane. I think we got a comment that Diane had some trouble looking at it. Um, Diane, I'm going to move it back one and then forward one just to see if that like resets it for you. I hope it does. So um, let's see some examples of halo niches, right? So when I was starting out at the beginning of last year, I came up with the idea that since I had worked for all those speakers and I had, you know, created webinars and stuff for them, that I would write webinars for other people. Now, um, I would write ideally webinars for large companies that wanted to do like sets of webinars. And that was a plan from over a year. It's, it's now like one of my clients. That's what I do. Like every, every month I have a certain number of like time put aside, you know, and billable work. And I like make them a webinar and help them make a webinar. Uh, it's enough of a halo niche that nobody that I talked to even knew that webinars were ghostwritten or could be ghostwritten or that they could like outsource a whole bunch of that work to themselves. It was so rare that even today, a year later, and it only took me like five days to get from nowhere to the top of this. If uh, if you Google webinar ghostwriter right now, ghostwriter is one word. Uh, once you scroll past the ads, I'm probably still the number one result on Google for that. And it only took, you know, a less than a week to get from nowhere to the top of those search results. Probably the same thing for CTO writer, right? It's it's a It's a niche that you would enjoy working in. And the customer didn't even know that it was solvable, but that you get them there with, you know, with your kind of work, your specialty. And uh, one of the other nice things about Halo niche work is that people who do that in your niche, and there really shouldn't be very many people in your niche, uh, whatever you charge or whatever you tell them the price for that kind of deliverable is, that's the price because they don't have anything to compare it to. And so if it costs, if you think it needs to cost X for you to, you know, be happy doing the work and, and it's profitable for you, X is the only price that they know. And if they can see themselves being moved from sort of their negative present, they didn't have a problem, they, the present wouldn't be negative, moving them to a positive future. And uh, you're the only one that they've ever talked to that does that kind of work. Your price is the price in the marketplace as far as they know and as far as they're concerned. So having a halo niche, taking the time to think through how to get to a halo niche is really valuable. And there are a couple of ways to do it, right? You can do a customer review. Now, uh, early on an earlier slide where I showed the various shapes and different customers falling into different parts, I find that most people have never done a customer review or client review, and they certainly don't do it regularly every six months or a year to figure out if every client is fulfilling the role that you've assigned them to in the slot that you've assigned them to. Uh, doing that and then combining that with, and you have to start this today or this week, right? Every every day or, or once a week or so on, look back and say like, what work did I do this week that I really liked doing? Like, what was really good? What did, what, what, what am I proud of? What did I get paid sufficiently for? If you combine those two processes of sorting out your customers based on your definition of their role in your business, and then working through and looking back what you worked on and what you liked to do, then you will arrive typically with ideas around what your halo niche can be. And the trick about the halo niche, like I just alluded to, is to the customer, it looks like a whole pyramid. It's a small pyramid, but it looks like a whole pyramid because you're the only one in it. And so like the whole market for webinar ghostwriters is me. And when they talk and talk about what they, you know, what they want to achieve with their webinars and building their audiences and that kind of stuff, I'm the only one that they know of that does this kind of work. To be honest, I'm still the only one that I know of myself that does this kind of work. 
And so what you, uh, what you end up with is a very different conversation about pricing because now it becomes, what can you do? And uh, I'm so happy that this could even be accomplished. Tell me what it's going to cost. And if there's a way to make that work with my budget, then I'm going to make it work with my budget because it solves a problem that I didn't even know was solvable. I knew I had a problem, but I keep ignoring it because there was no solution. So why spend time worrying about it? It turns out you should, you know, the solution is right there. Here's what it costs. How would you like to get to your positive future? It's a very different conversation. So three stories. I said I'd be out of here, you know, at half past. I'm sorry, some people seem to be having trouble with the screen. So uh, if they ask any questions or John, you have questions, we'll get to it. Right. But uh, the, sort of the three stories around pricing and why it's worth thinking about your value in, in, in different terms and how like the marketplace is going to look at the value is like there are different customers in different slots in your business. They're there now. You just haven't bothered to sort them yet. Sort them out and especially find your keep the lights on clients and nurture and cherish. And, and I love those people because they make everything else in your business possible. And then, you know, decide how uh, your new next breakthrough is going to affect your prices. You're going to move up in price or you're going to stay at the same price, but work less or take on more clients because you can, right? But you should know ahead of time how a breakthrough in productivity or efficiency or ability or skill set is going to like, change your, your business and your life and, and decide ahead of time how you want to do that. You do not want to just keep rolling on with the same thing you're always doing or else you'll end up leaving a lot of money on the table. And finally, it's worth the time, like reviewing where your customers are and reviewing what work you've done and what you really like to do and what was most profitable for you that you really like to do and whether there was a need for something instead of just like a want for it. You know, figuring out a halo niche sets you up for years for, you know, for the next stage of revenue for your business. And you can actually get away. You not only have you moved up the value chain in that pyramid, you've actually just become your own pyramid. And now, it's, you know, I really should have used something different besides pyramid because pyramid has like a negative connotation in a lot of business. That's but I'm not talking about any of that stuff. I'm just talking about how customers perceive value. And if you're the only one who does something, then you know, you're know you the value for that process. And whatever you say you charge, that's what people like you charge. You're probably never going to talk to anyone else who, who's in that halo niche because they don't know anyone who's in that halo niche. You don't even know anyone else who's in that halo niche. Um, all right, so I've taken up 27 minutes. Um, John, <laughs> any comments, anything about your own business? Well, yeah, you know, it's funny as you went through this, I had a couple of different thoughts and I, I don't think that pyramid is the wrong language because I think it's a really good way of describing this. Um, but yeah, it was funny as you went through, I said, oh, you know, I've seen, I've seen different examples myself of, you know, these areas. Obviously, we've all kind of felt... Uh, or been stuck in these different places. Right. Um, but the one that kind of caught me was um, uh, deciding how breakthrough would affect your prices. Because I know um, folks, especially, you know, in the area that I work in, um, we look and after a while, we're like, oh my gosh, we're saving this person like so much money yeah. or they're making so much more money than they were before. How can we renegotiate our prices? And the answer is that's very difficult. Yeah. It's hard to claw back. Like very hard the value to value they're getting, yeah, yeah, and sometimes yeah, it's very hard to take something from someone who thinks they deserve it. I know, and sometimes it's so astronomical because you know the difference may be, yeah. uh, you know, totally off the chart. Yeah, I've worked with like a bunch of people, and eventually, like, the only thing we've ever been able to figure out is like start treating it like a project, wind it down as a project, try to build in some time, say I'm taking like a three week vacation or something, then I'm yep. coming back and sort of like, you know, reworking how, how the business operates. You have to give them sort of a little, you know, nudge, right? You have to seed the change uh, idea in their head and then come back and say, hey, so like, you know, we spent, uh, we, we were trying to take a vacation. Turns out we ended up doing a lot of business modeling and figuring out, you know, how our own business should be structured. And these are our new prices. I see we got some questions. Oh, okay. Go ahead. Yeah. So Kathy had just mentioned uh, what pyramid accurately displays in the de is the decreasing number of people at each segment. Yes. Like I said, I am literally the only person on Google that you can Google and find for a webinar ghostwriter. That's yeah. not an accident. Same for CTO writer. Uh, Matt Mossman says, if you have time for questions. I do. What main bits make sales a different skill set than marketing? 
oh wow yes no sales and, and marketing are very different very different. almost never done by the same people except in very small companies right very very different just like just like <laughs> and delivery are almost never done by the same people right yeah what, i said right. that wrong operations and delivery basically this, are, they are the same thing but like yeah. marketing and delivery or marketing and operations are never the same people and for sales as well so uh let's just uh i think the question was about marketing versus sales marketing is a one to many conversation where yeah. there's far more outbound uh in the conversation outbound from you than inbound from clients right you know those are comments and that kind of stuff and but that's about it right and then um sales is always uh or at least in like a, a bigger or b2b or the bigger the deal size the bigger the the ticket price the bigger you know the dollar figure for someone who's purchasing something the the more likely it is that sales becomes a one-to-one -one conversation mm. definitely not a one-to-many conversation and so if you're um and because they're so different if you're going to focus on marketing right if you're going to buy your facebook ads and linkedin ads and you're going to be worried and you know, you're going to focus on content marketing you know, writing a bunch of articles and you know blog posts and that kind of stuff and that's how you're going to do your marketing then you uh, typically need to make your sales process as simplistic as possible. And then basically just double down on marketing, right? Get mm -hmm. as many people reading as much of your stuff as possible to make them feel safe to, to come close to you or to let, your, let you come close to their business or you know, the, their life, their company. And then uh, make the sales as easy as click here, click here, click here. And then you know, put in your credit card number or call this number and you're done. Right. In some cases, the sales process is a little more complicated. It's like a demo that needs to be done. You know, uh, you might have bespoke contracts for every client, you know, if they're big enough and you typically only work, you know, with that kind of stuff. But no, sales is very different than marketing. Marketing is very much an outbound and sales mm -hmm. is a two way kind of conversation. Yeah. The other the other thing that I would add, if you don't mind, yeah, um, yeah. one thing that I would say is um, so often we're kind of thinking, how do I how do I market to a you know, this huge group of people. In reality, marketing is a filter. So what we want to do is really filter out our ideal customers. So it's kind of that act of going through and figuring out the different ways that we can filter down our message to get to the ideal person that we want to serve, not everybody. So to me, to me, I always think of marketing as being a big filter. And I don't, I don't know that a lot of people look at it that way. Yeah. And then sales, we're really actively looking at, you know, how can, how can we um, sell more product or service to uh, varying clients and looking at that overall cycle of improvement. What are the different ways that we can um, improve our performance in that area? Yeah. And I would, I would point this out as well. The most common mistake and assumption in all of marketing and all of like junior people in marketing, you know, they graduate and they go into marketing. They think their job is to get the word out. And uh, that is the, if you if you think about the, the halo niche pyramid again, that's the lowest tranche in all of marketing is just get the word out, right? And then one up from that is picking your niche. This model applies to so many things. Picking your niche and like your target and going after just certain types of people. And, you know, and basically you're trying to overcome the, the, the their, their core uh, objection or core fear. So if you're selling to businesses, then their core fear is how do I know it's safe for me to vouch for you in here? You know, I can't let you talk to my boss. And then it turns out you guys can't even do what you say you're going to do. I'm going to look like an idiot. I might even get fired down the road. Right. And right. for a, a, and a B2C, it's how do I know I won't regret this purchase? Right. And by the way, B2C and, and B2B uh, also are not what most people think of. Right. B2C no. simply means the person that you're marketing or selling to has purchase authority and can make the purchase without, you know, con consulting anyone else. They might consult other people, but they don't have to, right? They can pull the trigger on it. A B2B sale is anything where you're trying to sell something and multiple people or groups are, you know, in, in a large company context, it's not just the, the VP and their department who wants to buy it. Like procurement has to be involved and the legal has to be involved and the executive budget committee. But like there's always like other people, right? And you're doing like a multi-sale really is what, what it is. So B2B, it takes multiple people to agree on the customer side before you get, you know, a commitment for money. B to C, one person can make the decision. It makes no difference if you're selling like to a consumer or a business. That's not really what B to B and B to C mean for small businesses when you're selling. It all comes down to how many people are involved in the purchase process on the customer side. 
Right. Uh, last one thing that I was going to um, read off here, and for, I'm sorry if I say your name incorrectly, uh, Nikunj Garg, uh, sales and marketing are interlinked. They're definitely very interlinked. Oh, very much so. No, yeah. they're very different. They're super interlinked. Right. Marketing's job is to um, move as many people directly to sales as possible, right? They have sort of a split role. Uh, their, their job is to create leads and then from those leads, extract prospects. Sales is not interested in leads. Sales is only interested in prospects. Sales couldn't possibly and will never have the, you know, the head count or manpower to be able to, do we still say manpower? Human power seems weird. Human power. <laughs> Whatever, right? Sales, sales people do not have and will never have time to chase down every lead, right? So it's marketing's job to A, collect all the leads, to create the leads. And then from that, from people's behaviors or they're interested in more stuff, they're willing to watch through a demo, that kind of stuff, start mm -hmm. like extracting some small portion of those leads as prospects. And those are individuals that it might make sense for sales to talk to. So yeah, their marketing's job is to feed sales. Sales' job is to create revenue, which in part funds marketing. And then, you know, it's a virtuous circle. Yeah, you know, if I if I can add on to what you just said, um, the one thing that I would say is it's marketing's job to tailor the message or the ideal message to the consumer, and it's sales job to repeat that message, but to but to also um, talk to the customer about how that benefits them. Right. Marketing does nothing bespoke, right? It does not make messages for a single person based on that person's own unique needs or that person's business's own unique needs. Yes. That's sales job. Yeah, Kathy says resources replacement, word for manpower. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, there you go. Thank you very much, Kathy. That works. <laughs> uh, all right. We went a little bit over our half an hour. It's all right. Yeah. All right. Are you good? I'm good. Thanks for inviting me. You want to wind it down? Oh, you're always welcome. Um, all right. Yeah. I think that's done. Uh, okay. Thanks, everyone. Uh, I'm going to be doing these every couple of weeks. So between the thing I have with Heather, like for growing your, your audience's business, and then these, um, it's, we're looking at a minimum of three per month. Although John just challenged me to do one per day for all of March. I would do it. The good news is it's March 1st. So we've already got that one knocked out. But I don't know what we talk about tomorrow. All right. I think that's it for us, John. Let's I close think so. it down. All right. Bye, everyone. Thanks again. Bye. bye.